Good morning and welcome to Foley Assembly. So excited to be in the house of the Lord with you guys. Um, service is a little bit different today. It's going to be a little bit unique. I'm going to go ahead and welcome and open up and start announcements. Um, we have baptisms today. We have prayer and worship today. It's going to be an exciting day. I hope you came fasted. I hope you came prayed up, ready to go. So with that being said, I want to welcome all of our guests. Like I said, it's going to be a little bit different, a little unique today, but I just want to say welcome. Thank you for being here with us. If you look in front of you, you should see a connect card or a prayer request card. They're, the prayer request on one side, connect card on the other. You can fill that out if you have a prayer request or if you want to find out more information about the church, some things that we have going on, then that's going to be the best way to do it. You can fill that out, drop it in the tithe and offering box. A um, couple of quick announcements. Next week launches our life groups. Next week launches Sunday school, all of that starting back up. If you look on the welcome desk, there's these right here, these cards. And so any group that you're interested in, any ministry, any Sunday school, if you want to know more information, if you want to sign up, if you want to say, I'm going to be there, then I want you to stop on your way out at the welcome desk and, and see all of the things that we have going on, all the different ways for us to do life together. Um, we had our final fam class. If anybody has not seen me the last couple Sundays, it's because we've been doing that. So I've been back there up until service starts, but I've missed hanging out with you guys. But um, the final class today was just talking about doing life together, and that's what we believe. We believe that the church was meant to do life together, uh, whether it be Sunday schools, Bible studies, fellowship, whatever it is. So I, I want you to get plugged in. I want you to get involved. Next Sunday starts, launches the Sunday school. So we'll have um, two adult classes for you. It's going to be at the nine o'clock hour. We will have a teenage Sunday school, a children's Sunday school, and a nursery Sunday school. So everything for you to get plugged in. We took the month of August off to do the fam class and to give everybody a chance to kind of get adjusted to school starting back and all of that good stuff, but we are relaunching for eight more weeks starting next Sunday. Um, again, stop by and see all the different groups and ministries and things that we have going on. Um, all of the groups you normally hear me mention, the discipleship training, Never Alone, Nursery, Fishula, all of that stuff, it's all going to be out there. So if you want more information, fill your name out, drop it in tithe and offering box, and that leader, they'll get in touch with you and they'll let you know about all the upcoming events and they'll get you plugged in where you can uh, really join and find your community with them together. Um, this Tuesday is men's meeting. We have our man-to-man -man meeting this Tuesday for all of our men. It's going to be at 6.30 in the fellowship hall. Come out, join us. We do have adult service this Wednesday, so we will have adults. Um, I also want to make quick mention of one announcement. Coming up on October 13th, we are going to have a missions banquet. So this is going to be on Sunday, October 13th at 5 o'clock p.m. So you'll come to church. Um, we're, going to have, we're going to have guest missionaries there with us Sunday morning. They are missionaries to a um, a, a country that they're not allowed to be Christians in. And so it's a sensitive country. So I'm not going to say their name on live stream or anything like that, but they'll be here with us and they'll also be with us for the banquet. Um, the cost is five bucks a person just to help cover the cost of food. Um, but I want you to make plans to come and join. And um, you can RSVP by going on our website, foliassembly.com. You can see the missions banquet and just let us know that you're coming simply so that we know how much food to provide. But this is just going to be a day of celebration. It's going to be celebrating all that God has done through Foley Assembly, through missions, um, this previous year and up to this point, as well as go ahead and look forward to next year and, and, and say, okay, God, what do you want to do next? What, what more do you want to do? What more can we do um, as we see the gospel taken across the world? So that's October 13th at 5 o'clock p.m. That's going to be the missions banquet. Why don't you go online and RSVP for that? If you have your tithes and offerings with you, you can fill them out. You can drop them in the box. You can give online, whichever is easiest for you. But at this time, I'm going to go ahead and bring our baptismal candidates up. If you guys will make your way up on stage for me. As they're making their way up, like I said, this is a day of celebration um, that we're going to come together and we're going to celebrate together. We have um, one, two... We got more. Where are they at? Let's see. I know they're here. Where's Joseph? You guys can go ahead. Oh, they're already in the back. What? They're hiding from me because I said that I was going to make them uh, say something. You guys can go ahead and come on up. You don't have to say anything, but you face that way. Can they hear me? Man. Yeah, tell them to come on out here. They thought they were hiding. Come on, come on. There we go. There we go. You guys can spread across the stage. You guys spread across the stage and face this way. These are all of our baptismal candidates that we have that are going to be baptized. Everybody that has made a commitment 
to say, I'm following Jesus and I wanna go public with it. I told him that you're gonna get buried beneath the water and it's a new creation coming up, hence the shirts made new. Um, but we're gonna do it a little bit different. We're actually gonna be baptizing while we're worshiping. The reason why is because I believe that baptism is supposed to be a celebration. I believe it's supposed to be worship. So as you're worshiping and as we're singing and saying hell lost another one, we're gonna be celebrating that hell has lost another one and buried it underneath the water. So I want you to celebrate. I want you to get excited. As you see them go into the water, every time you see someone come up, I want you to cheer, I want you to shout, I want you to yell because heaven, all of heaven, rejoices over one person coming to know Jesus Christ. And I know some of you got really excited and were yelling at your TV screen last night watching your favorite college football team. So if we can get excited and cheer over a touchdown, then we absolutely can get excited over someone entering into the kingdom of God. Amen. Did anybody want to say anything? Anybody? I want to I want to open up the opportunity for if you're if you want to tell us why you're getting getting baptized. If you don't feel comfortable, that's okay. You can pass to the next person, but I'm going to start with you, Lacey. She's like, "Really? Why don't you start over here?" <laughs> Somebody I don't like it. All right. So, uh, my name is Mason. Um, I won't be long on this, but uh I you know Jesus commanded us to be baptized and I feel like that's something God's been calling me to do, so that's what I'm going to be here today and do that. Hi, my name is Pat. I was fortunate enough to know Jesus my whole life. I was raised Catholic, but I wasn't very close to Jesus until this year, so I figured there wasn't a better time but now to do this. So. And just so you guys can keep them in prayer, Lacey, Shane, Ethan, Mason, Tennyson, Pat, and Joseph have all made the decision to give their lives to the Lord, and they, they want to make public that. So right now, why don't you go ahead and stretch your hands this way, and let's pray over them. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for every single person here. Lord, I thank you for all of these who have made a commitment to follow you, Lord. They've accepted you as their Lord and personal Savior, and God, they want to go public with that commitment. Lord, I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, God, that the old would be left in the water, the new creation would walk out, Father, that you would fill them full of your Spirit, God, as you, Jesus, were baptized in the Holy Spirit after your baptism. I pray so your Spirit would fall fresh on them as they come up out of the water. God, I come against every evil one that would try and steal any seed away, God, anyone that would whisper any lack of salvation or any prodigal or falling away. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that every seed would find good soil, God, that you would let it be fertile ground, that they would you would raise them up, fill them full of your spirit to be laborers, God, to go and produce fruit, God, hundredfold fruit, Lord, we pray that you would let a blessing fall on them, empowerment fall on them, Lord, and we rejoice what you've done today. We glorify you, and we praise you, and we thank you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. Why don't you guys get ready to stand up, and let's get started. Say 
Savior, I thank God. I cannot deny what I've seen. Got no choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friends, a burden and bitterness. You just keep them moving. You ain't welcome here. From now till I walk the streets of gold. I'll sing of how you saved my soul. This wayward son has found his way back home. You picked me up, you turned me around, and placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because you healed my heart, you changed my name forever free. I thank the Savior, I thank God. There's nothing what I am free. I am free. I am free. Have lost nothing what I am free. I am free. I am free. Have lost nothing what I am Another one, I am free. Oh, I am free. I am free. Hell us another one, I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell us another one, I am free. Oh, I am free. I am free. Hell us another one, I am free. Oh, I am free. Oh, I am free. Hell us Savior, because you healed my heart, you changed my name, forever free, I am not the same, I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, I thank God. You lost nothing Lost another one, I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one, I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one, I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. You healed my heart, you changed my name, forever free, I am not the same, I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, I thank
bring new wine. God, we don't want to be stuck in the old. We don't want to be stuck in the past. God, no, we need fresh wet bread today. We need new wine today. God, we need a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit today. God, we, we aren't satisfied with what you did yesterday. God, we know that you're still able abundantly above all things to do more than what we can even comprehend today. God, let it flow today. Let your spirit rain down today. God, come and fill this place right now in the name of Jesus. God, let new wine fall fresh. Let the Holy Spirit of God fall fresh. Lord, we just come to you. We lay every need down, every sickness down, every issue down. God, I pray healing in the name of Jesus. I pray miracles, signs, and wonders. God, I pray that the glory of God, that you would manifest yourself in this place today. Lord, we need you, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. Why don't you just enter into a time of worship, whatever that looks like for you. You can lift your hands, you can clap, you can shout, you can pray, you can pray in your prayer lane, whatever it is, but let's just worship him a little bit more. Let's just worship him a little bit more. Just tell him how good he's been to you. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We glorify you. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You are mighty. You are abundantly, God, above all we could ask or think. Thank you for being so good to us. I don't know about you, but this gets me excited because I remember the day he picked me up. I remember the day he turned me around. I remember the day he set me on a new path, a new calling, a new purpose. I was made new in Christ. Does anybody remember what that felt like to be a new creation in Christ? Oh, restore to us the joy of our salvation. Go ahead, Hannah. Lord. Yes, Lord. Jesus, Yes, Jesus. Make me Come on, sing to him this morning. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to do. God, I came here with nothing. And all you have given me, Jesus, bring me. naked we came into this world naked we will return God everything we have has been given to us by you so Lord whatever season we find ourselves at God we will still say blessed be the name of the Lord God Almighty the one the Lord who gives the Lord who takes away father you are in complete control God we're right now on this altar God we lay 
all of our hindrances down. We lay all of our motivations down, all of our intentions down. God, here, here in this place, in this moment, God, we humble ourselves before you. Underneath your mighty hand, God, we cast all our anxieties on you. God, we cast all our depressions on you. We cast all of our sicknesses on you. Lord, we pray, God, that your spirit would come and have his way in this place, God. God, that you would bring, that you would set the captives free, God, that you would bring healing, God, to those that are dealing with cancer and sickness and illness and disease, God, that you would do mighty works today, God. We pray healing in the name of Jesus, God. We're believing for it. We're expecting you to do what only you can do. So, God, I pray, come, Lord Jesus, we turn our face toward you. We lay every need down at your feet, and we ask you, Lord, we ask you, Lord, to come and meet us where we're at. Come and meet us where we're at, Lord. We, we kneel down at your feet and we acknowledge, God, we are nothing without you. We need you, Jesus. We need a fresh touch from you today, a fresh word from you today, a fresh encounter with you today, Lord. We need a fresh power today, God. We need you, Jesus. So I pray you, Lord, you would come and have your way. Lord, have your way in this place, God. We make room for you. We rest in your presence. We thank you for all your good deeds, all the things you've done and the things that you will continue to do, God. We know we step out in faith and we believe for it. We ask for it. We knock and we continue to seek. And Lord, we seek your face. It's in your presence, God. It's in your presence that things begin to change. So Lord, grant us with your presence today. I pray that you would come and dwell in our midst. Holy Spirit, come and dwell in this place. We remove ourselves and we ask, Lord Jesus, you you come and walk up and down these aisles. You touch every heart. Right now, God, I pray you would soften every heart. God, I pray you would prepare our hearts for you, Jesus, for what you're going to do. We know that you're just getting started, and we say, yes, Lord, let it grow. Let it continue. Let your spirit flow. God, we love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you, and we magnify you. And everybody in the house says, Amen and amen. You may be seated for just a moment. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. We will not be doing, we will not have kids church or, or toddler class. The nursery is open, but here's the reason. Here's the reason. Today is a different service. I told you today was going to be a little bit different. I'm not going to be here long. I'm only going to speak for about 20 minutes. So if you can give me about 20 minutes, then we're going to go right back into prayer and we're going to go right back into worship because here's the thing that God has placed on my heart. The Lord has said that today it needs to be a day of preparation. Meaning before you go and you build a fire, if before you have a fire, you got to go and you got to collect the firewood and you got to go and get some kindling. You got to go and get a lighter unless you're like, you know, one of those people that can start without a lighter. I can't do that, but I got to go and get a lighter. And so you've got to make preparation for the fire to fall. You've got to make a preparation for the fire. And the Lord has said that today is a day of preparation. Today is a day where we do our part, where we make our hearts ready for the fire of God to fall in this place. So I'm not going to be long. So if you give me about 20 minutes, then we're we're going to flow right back into prayer and right back into worship. But if you have your Bibles, we're going to be on Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28, verse 10 through 19. Like I said, won't be long. We've been talking about the anointing. We've been talking about how we've been anointed as priests and kings and anointed as prophets of God. But today we're going to anoint the house. We're going to anoint the house of God. We're going to say, Lord, this house is your house. We set it apart. We consecrate it. Lord, we give all of ourselves unto you. And so if you found your verse in Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 19, this is the story of Jacob. Jacob's the grandson of Abraham. Now, Jacob was a trickster. He was a deceiver. He was the one, and, and he, had, he had stolen his brother's birthright, and he had stolen his brother's blessing. And here, after that, Esau wasn't happy about it. He said, okay, the birthright I got some soup out of, but now you stole my blessing. You didn't give me no soup or nothing. So he was, he was pretty upset. And so Isaac told Jacob, look, you need to go. You need to return, uh, you need to, return to Padden Aram. You need to go to your uncle Laban's house because Esau is trying to kill you. Esau is coming after you because you tricked him and you stole his blessing. And so Jacob has to travel from where he's at in Beersheba and he's heading toward Haran and that's 550 miles, 550 miles. And Jacob comes to a place in verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and he went toward Haran and he came to a certain place and he stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and he lay down in that place to sleep. So here's Jacob, the trickster, the deceiver, the one that, that is now fleeing from everybody. And Jacob has found himself completely alone. Jacob is in the middle of the wilderness with nobody around, nothing to see except the stars in the sky and the nice comfy stone pillow that he's laying his head on. 
He has now adventured into a place of vulnerability, a place that I like to call a place in the middle. Jacob is no longer in his past and he's not yet to his future. So he's in this place in the middle middle. and what he did here, what happens in this middle moment would decide, would determine what would happen in his future. So Jacob had made, he didn't do much. Jacob didn't do anything spectacular. He just made himself available. He wasn't stealing a birthright or a blessing. He hasn't yet come to Laban's house. He was in the middle, in the wilderness, by himself, at night, available. And it was in that place, verse 12 through 13. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth. And the top of it reached to the heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. So Jacob finds himself in the middle. He finds himself in this place of vulnerability. And finally, the Lord has gotten him to a place where he can show him a dream. And so he sees this dream and he sees this ladder going up to heaven. He sees angels going up and going down. He has found himself in a place of supernatural activity. Jacob has found himself in a place that he would name the house of God. This is a place where heaven and earth would connect. Are you guys ready to pray today? This is a place where heaven and earth connected. Now, some translations say, some translations say that he didn't see the Lord above the ladder. He saw the Lord beside him. In fact, it really could go either way. I'm going to tell you my opinion. All right, it doesn't mean anything. I believe, I believe that he saw the Lord beside him. Not just on top of the ladder. Why do I say that? Because of what Jesus said in John 151. Jesus said, and he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Jesus Christ is the bottom of the ladder. So I believe that Jacob saw a a Christophany, if you will, a fun theological word. I believe Jacob saw Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. I believe he saw Jesus, the Lord God Almighty, standing next to him. And now Jesus has stepped onto the scene and he said, hey, I'm that person. I'm that connection. I'm the one that connects heaven and earth. So wherever there is a willing vessel, Wherever there is a willing vessel for Jesus to use, there is supernatural power to be tapped into. So wherever we find our place, we say, Jesus, you are welcome here. You're not just inviting just any old person in. You're inviting the Son of Man. You're inviting the connection to heaven into your life where angels can go up and come down. You're inviting supernatural power into your life. But the first point on this day of preparation as we prepare our hearts and minds is point number one. We have to recognize the glory of God. Recognize the glory of God and the power of God. You see, too often we find ourselves where we're too busy looking back at the past. Or maybe we're in fear thinking nonstop about what our future might hold. And we rarely take the time to stop and recognize that today there is new wine. That today there is fresh power available. That today it's available. God's glory is present and it happens in every one of us today. Do we recognize it? It starts with us finding a place to encounter the presence of God. How much time do we spend encountering the presence of God? How much time do we spend in the place where we know God will speak? You see, a lot of us, we have a difficult time carving out moments of time, quiet moments where we can get alone in the presence of God. But it's only in that place where we're not thinking about anything else, where we come in our prayer closet, we come in our secret place and we get alone with God and we say, "Okay, Lord, speak. Okay, God, speak to us. God, I want to encounter you fresh today. I want a fresh wind, a fresh fire. God, what do you have for me today? Tapping into supernatural power allows us to accept the Father's will. Whenever you get into the Father's presence, you then have no choice by the Spirit of God who discerns the mind of God to come in alignment with the will of God, to then do the plans and purposes of God, which then means as we do those things, we can then stand on the promises of God. And it's the same with Jacob. Look what God says to him in verse 13 and through 15. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord. I'm the God of Abraham, your father and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, Jacob, I will give to you and all your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth and you shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north and to the south. And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you. 
and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. There are promises of God, and that's the thing. As we are a body of Christ, there are promises. So he, here, here's the promises that God made to Jacob. He said, one, Jacob, I'm a covenant-keeping God. I'm a covenant-keeping God. I do what I say I will do. Jacob, your offspring, your territory, your impact, your authority will spread to the north, south, east, and the west. You will not be bound in what you are doing. All of the earth will be blessed through you, Jacob. But more importantly than that, Jacob, I'm with you. Wherever you go, the Lord is with you. You're never alone. There's no moment in time where you may be scared, you may be fearful, but the Lord is with you. Can I tell you that as a body of Christ, we, by coming in alignment with the will of God, can also tap into the promises of God. Malachi 3.6 tells me that the Lord does not change, meaning the same God that worked miracles then, the same God that brought healings then and deliverances then is the same God that can bring it today. The same God that poured revival down then is the same God that can pour revival out today. He's the same God today that he was on the day of Pentecost. He is a God that is faithful in all of his promises. He promises to his church. He said, listen, I'm going to build my church. And guess what? The gates of hell will not be able to stand against, which tells me if we walk wherever we go, wherever we set our foot, the territory, the impact, the authority of the church will expand to the north, south, east and the west. And there is not a single through single thing that any demon in all of hell can do about it. There is nothing that will stop the authority given to us by Jesus Christ if we walk in it, if we recognize the power and glory of God. A promise of God tells me that at the end of this story, every knee will bow. Amen. No matter what it looks like right now, no matter how fearful we may find ourselves, no matter what moment in time you find yourself, on, whether you're on the mountain or you're in the valley, the book of Revelation tells me that when the end comes, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you know what he says then? We'll rule and reign with him for all of eternity. Your sickness will not bind you then. Your healing will come in the name of Jesus. Your deliverance will come in the name of Jesus. What, wherever you find yourself here on this earth, when we get to that side of heaven, we will rule and reign with Christ for all of eternity. That's the end of the story. That's what we have to look forward to. That's the reason that the apostles, they were hanging on the cross. Peter probably crucified upside down. And he said, don't, I don't deserve to die the same way that Jesus died. You better do something different. But here's the thing you need to know. By killing me, you're allowing me access to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I've been waiting on. And we as a church, we have that same hope. Why do you go into the jungles of Ecuador? Why do you go into the jungles of Africa? Why do you stand and you're willing to make a difference and to be a witness? Because it's worth it. Because I know the end of the story and I know that every knee will bow and confess and I want them to do it willingly. I want them to confess the Lord Jesus Christ willingly before the day comes where they are forced to. His promises that he promises that he will never leave us. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So if God is for us, then who can be against us? Here's the thing. What God gave you, the enemy can't take it away. Because it didn't come from him, it came from God. The anointing over your life came from God. Your family came from God. Your job came from God. Everything that you have came from God. The enemy can't steal what God has given you. We stand on the promises of God that are found in the presence of God. But the question is, do we recognize his presence? Do we recognize, do we take time to find ourselves, not looking around, not distracted, put our phone, we get into the presence of God and we say, okay, God, I need a fresh word from you. Verse 16 through 19. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I didn't know it. And he was afraid. And he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took a stone, the comfy pillow he had, and he set it up as a pillar and he poured oil on top of it. And he anointed that place and he named it Bethel, which means house of God. This place, Jacob woke up, he said, this place will be called Bethel because it is a house of God. Meaning he felt God's presence in such a real way that he, he woke up, he said, this has to be where the Lord dwells. If God is dwelling anywhere on this earth, if he can set up his shop and lay his head down at one place, this has got to be it because his presence is here. 
This has got to be the house of God. And I, my, my, what I'm here today is say, yes, Lord, let it be here as well. Let God's presence be so thick in this house. Let this house be anointed. Let it be consecrated. Let it be set apart as a house of God, not just in name. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. I don't want to just be a house of God in name. I want to be a house of God in presence. I want God's presence to be so real, so tangible that people walk in and they say, the Lord has to be dwelling in this place because his presence is here. This has to be a house of God. You know, when people come to visit, I want them to say a lot of things. I want them to feel welcomed. I want them to get a nice cup of coffee. I want them to say these people are friendly and the worship is amazing and it's just a sweet, sweet feel in this place. I want them to say all of those things, but more than anything else, more than anything else, my desire is if people walk into this place, as they walk into this sanctuary, I want them to feel the presence of God. I want them to see the presence of God that we have prepared for, that we have, that Pastor Judd has prepared for, labored over, prayed over. I want them to know that this house is a house of prayer. This house is a house of worship. This is a house of God. This is where God dwells. This is where he lives. That they could not deny it. And how do we do that prayer? Devotion, fasting. But also, here's the other way. Not only is this a house of God, but because of Jesus, we now are the temples of the living God, which means you individually are a house of God, which means your family is a house of God, which means your marriage is a house of God, which means the home at which you live, that is also a house of God. And so by prayer and devotion, you make your house a house of God and you make your house a house of God and the fire falls on you and you encounter the presence of God. And then we live our lives on fire throughout the week. What's going to happen when we come in here on Sunday? That fire is going to connect with that fire and that fire and that fire. And we spit the whole week on fire, we then come in here on Sunday and the fire combines together in this explosion of God's presence in this place. In the temple of God, as we, the individual temples of God, join together. It's not just a Sunday. It's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Every single one of us in God's presence. Every single one of us encountering the power of God. Every single one of us walking in the anointing of God. And then we come together and we just celebrate what God has done on Sundays. That's the way it was meant to look. Jacob had this incredible experience, but he wasn't quite where he needed to be yet. Verse 20 through 22. Then Jacob made a vow saying, Okay, if God will be with me and he'll keep me in this way that I go, then if he gives me bread to eat and he gives me clothing to wear and he, then if he allows me to come to my father's house in peace, then okay, then Lord, then you can be my God. <laughs> He's making bargainings with God. And this stone on which I have set up a pillar, this will be God's house. And of all that you have given me, I will give a full tenth to you. So Jacob's basically sitting there. He's like, okay, God, interviewing him. Are you going to give me food to eat? Check. Okay. Are you going to give me clothes to wear? Okay. Check. How many of us have done? We've all been there. We all like to poke, poke fun at Jacob, but we all done it. God, if you will do this, then I'll know that you're real. God, if you'll do this, then I'll serve you. God, if you just provide this, then I will know that you are my God. And God's like, that's no problem. I've already told you that I'm your God. I've already given you my word. I've already spoken the promises over you. But sometimes it takes us a little bit of time like it did Jacob. But Jacob eventually leaves the house of God. He leaves Bethel and he goes to his uncle Laban's house. We all know the story. He works. He marries Leah. He marries Rachel. They have children. And the Lord increases his prosperity. The man grows. Jacob grows. And, and he has all of these flocks and all of these herdsmen. And then he gets to the point in Genesis 31:13 that he has another encounter with God. And it says, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me. Now arise, go out of this land and return to the land of your kindred. Jacob, you've remained in this place long enough. I have proven myself faithful. You have had clothes to wear. You have had food to eat. I have increased you, and now I'm taking you back where you are meant to be. You have been here long enough. Jacob, I want you to return to your kindred. I, I want you to return and walk in your promise. And I want you to return to the place that you encountered me. In preparation, the second thing we have to do is we have to return to the place we encountered God. Revelation 2, 4 through 5. But I have this against you. This is Jesus talking to the church of Ephesus. I have this against you. That you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works that you did at first. If not, I will come to you 
and I will remove your lampstand unless you repent. Some of us on this day of preparation have encountered and recognized the glory of God, but somewhere along the way, the fire grew dim. Somewhere along the way, we got filled up, we got empowered, we got anointed, and and God manifested his presence in such a real way, but enough time has gone by. The world has taken its toll on you enough that that fire that once burned brightly has now grown dim. And the call this morning, the call this morning is to stir you up and to fan you into flame. Or maybe you've never encountered God. Maybe there is no flame at all. Then I'm here to tell you today that salvation belongs to the Lord. It's available for you today. I I just ask you to soften your heart. I ask you to allow Jesus into your heart, to allow him to set you on fire, make way for him in your hearts. But what happens to most of us? What happens to most of us is we have an encounter and we're on fire, but then this happens and, and this happens or, or maybe nothing happens, but maybe life happens. And we go to church on Sunday and Sunday and over and over and over. And then little by little, that flame diminishes. But there's no limit to the amount of God that we can receive. The limit is how much we desire to receive, meaning there's enough God to go around. He can he can fill you up over and over and over and over. And you're never going to outgive God. God will give you more of his presence, more of his presence, more of his presence. But what are we offering him as a vessel? What are we giving him to pour into? Because if you if you say, "Okay, God, I give you eight ounces, you're going to get eight ounces of God. You say, okay, God, I give you a gallon. You're going to get a gallon of God. You say, God, I want an ocean of you. Then you're going to get an ocean of God. What is your desire to experience him? What is, how much of God do you want to receive? God will do his part, but it's up to us to give him something to work with. Here's the thing that God, I feel like God is saying is he can provide all the oil. He can provide all the oil and all the anointing, but there's got to be a spark. There has to be a spark for it to connect to. If there is no spark, then the oil will go to use. There's nothing for it to to set on fire. We have to give God a spark, and we have to do that by returning to the place we've encountered him. So today, at the sound of my voice, the plea is to return. If there's no spark, little spark, maybe you're a full bonfire on fire for God. I still want us to return and get more. You may be on fire more than you've ever been before, but there's still more God. We can never tap out of God's resources. So this morning, return to the place of encounter. Return to the place and remember the power of God. Remember the mission that God has given you. Remember the word that God has spoken to you. Remember the salvation of the Lord. Remember the grace that found you. Remember the grace that found you when you were in a miry pit. And you were living your life in sin and you had no purpose and you were full of sin and shame. And then God found you there. Remember that moment. Remember the grace of God that saved you. And remember the works that you did in order for others to experience that grace as well. I've told you, when Jesus radically saved me and and set me on the right path, I needed everybody to know. Those are the first works. As we return to our first love, we'll have no choice but return to our first works. Because as we remember the love of God, the glory of God, the grace of God, we have no choice but to go and make sure others feel the same. Others need to know, too. They need to know what we know because we come in here and we encounter the presence of God. But what about the people that aren't in here right now? What about the people that aren't in this church doors? No, he said, you're the church. You take the presence to them. You take the power of God to them. They need to know. Remember your first love. Remember the power of God. Remember the presence of God, the grace of God. Remember your first works. Remember the day you tasted and saw that the Lord is good. Do you remember If we ever get to a point where baptisms grow old, if you ever get to a point where living as a new creation gets old, then that fire needs to be fanned into flame. Anytime we get to the point where coming to church gets old and you don't want to do and all of these things, no, that means that that fire is growing dim and we need a fresh flame today. We need a fresh fire today. We need a fresh wind of his Holy Spirit today. The biggest threat, the biggest threat in our modern America is to be so distracted And so busy that we lose sight of the passion, the zeal, and the fervor that we once followed God with. I love when people first get saved. When people first get saved, do you remember when you first got saved? You wanted to tell anyone and everyone about what the Lord has done. And we still see it today. People get saved. God changes their life. They're so excited. They need people to know. And then somewhere along the way, we begin to lose that. 
Somewhere along the way, we begin to think that we, maybe we created our own righteousness. And, and now I, I don't sin because I'm being a good person. And, and little by little, we lose that fervor. We lose that spirit. We lose that fire. We become distracted with all of the things that this world has to offer. And the whole time, God is saying, remember and return to the feet of Jesus. Remember and return to the altar. Remember and return to the place of God. But Jacob, like many of us, he delayed. In fact, he probably delayed about 10 years, they say. He started in the right direction. But then he found himself face to face with his brother Esau. And that fear was greater than his faith. And it led him to flee in the opposite direction. It is in that moment that he wrestled with God. And then following that, he goes to a place called Succoth. And he even builds a house and sets up shop there. That's not where God told him to go. He builds a barn, and you know what? He even built an altar to the Lord in Succoth, but that was not what God asked him to do. That was not where God told him to go. You can make sacrifices, but if it's a sacrifice made in disobedience, that sacrifice means nothing to God. If it's a sacrifice made in disobedience, it doesn't mean anything, meaning you can come to church. You can read your Bible. You can even be a witness. You can tell all of the mighty things that God is doing. But if we are doing that while living in rebellion, while living in sin, while rejecting the will of God, rejecting the word of God, rejecting the standard of God, then all of those sacrifices mean nothing to God because we are walking in disobedience. God wants more than mercy, more than sacrifices. He desires obedience. Jacob finally goes to Shechem. And there in Shechem, all kinds of evil breaks out. The defiling of Dinah and all of the, it's evil. It's an evil chapter. And then finally, after that chapter, God clarifies, Genesis 35, 1. He said, you know what, Jacob? Arise and go to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar, not a pillar, make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. This time, Jacob, I want you to return to Bethel. I want you to return to the house of God. I want you to return and encounter the presence of God. But Jacob, I don't want a pillar. I want an altar. Before the fire can fall, we have to build an altar. We spend a lot of time building a home. We spend a lot of time maybe remodeling a car, building wealth and building a life for ourselves and building a legacy. But the most important thing you can build is an altar. The most important thing you can build is an altar. And no, I'm not talking about a physical structure. I'm talking about making your life a living sacrifice, making your life an altar on fire before God. That is more important than how much money you leave. That is more important than what house you leave and what cars you leave. More than anything else, you need to leave behind a willingness to find their life at the altar. The altar is where sin will go to die where spiritual laziness goes to die. The altar is where my dreams and my desires and what I want my life to look like, the altar is where my flesh, all of those things is where it goes to die, that I might receive what God has for me. Because what he has for me is better than what you and I have for ourselves. What God has spoken, what the word that he has spoken to you, the will of God over your life, that plan and purpose is greater than anything that you could ever manufacture for yourself. We have to build an altar. Finally, Jacob agrees. Jacob agrees after 10 years to walk in obedience. And notice what comes next. Verse 2 through 4. Then Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress. And he has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears. And Jacob hid them and buried them underneath the tree that was near Shechem. Jacob could only lead his family in the proper where to go after he decided himself to walk in obedience. It started with him. His family was living in idolatry. His family was walking in disobedience. Why? Because he was walking in disobedience. It started with him. Guess what? Judgment starts in the house of God first. It starts with you and I. Before anyone else will follow, it starts with those who have already encountered God's presence. It starts with those in the church house that have already been changed by the presence of God. It has to start with us walking in obedience first. It starts with us men to lead our families in our obedience 
to lead our families and our wives in obedience. It starts with us, men, women, husbands, wives, parents, grandparents, whatever it is, what behavior you use is what will be emulated. What do you want emulated? The people that God has placed in your life, your grandchildren, your children, nieces, nephews, whatever it may be, they're going to watch you. And they're going to emulate what they see. What are they seeing? Are they seeing you walk in obedience to the Lord God Almighty? Are they seeing you demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit? What are they watching? Are they watching us lead our families to the presence of God? Jacob said, you, need, you guys need to purify yourselves. We're going to the house of God, and we're going to build an altar. Are we leading our families into the presence of God? Are we leading them to the altar? Are we leading our families to the altar? Because here's the thing, we have to be willing to go first. We have to be willing to go first. You and I have to be willing to get in God's presence, to get the word of God inside of our hearts, and then that we might go and lead others in the exact same thing that we have received, but we can only lead them in the way that we have first gone. It starts and it ends with the house of God, our children, this nursery, this kids ministry, this youth ministry, all of the kids in this house, they're going to be following you. They're going to be watching you. They're going to be following after you. Where are we leading them? Are we leading them to the presence of God? Are we telling them that the presence of God is a place of cleansing? where all idolatry, where all distractions, where all sinfulness must be washed away by the blood of Jesus? Are we telling them that God has set it up where we are living sacrifices? Child, grandchild, niece, nephew, we are living sacrifices. We are altars where the old man has died, baptism, the old man is gone. We are now new creations in Christ Jesus. We have been made one with God, reconnected with God, and now we live our lives on fire for God. You, child of God, are an altar of worship unto the Lord God Almighty. Are we on fire for God, announcing the saving power of Jesus Christ? And I love this in verse 5. As they walked in obedience... A terror from God fell upon the cities so that they could not attack and they could not pursue them. As we recognize and return to the presence of God, as we walk in obedience of God, all enemies will tremble in terror from the people of God and the obedience to God. Meaning as we come together and we get in God's presence and we return to our first love and we return on fire and we lead our families in obedience, we lead this church in obedience, everyone around us we lead in obedience, there is nothing that the darkness can do to stop you. They will tremble in terror. All demons tremble at the name of Jesus. They tremble at the name of Jesus. So we come together, we get empowered, and then we go and walk in obedience and watch as the light covers the darkness and the darkness flees and the demons tremble and all of our enemies fall beneath the Lord. But here's what I don't understand. Here's what I don't understand. Jacob encountered God again. He has his name changed from Jacob to Israel. God confirms the covenant with him. He said, but now I'm the God of Abraham I'm the God of Isaac, and I'm also the God of Jacob. But in 35, 16, Genesis 35, 16, Jacob left. But God said to him in Genesis 35, verse 1, I want you to go to Bethel, and I want you to dwell there. Why did he leave? Point number three, remain in the presence of the Lord. Don't leave. Don't fear. You may be uncomfortable. God may call you to do things that you're not okay with. God may ask you to step out of your comfort zone, whatever it may be, but not for fear, not for worry, not for being uncomfortable. Do not leave the presence of God. Return to the presence of God. Return to the house of God and remain there. Dwell in the presence of God. Remain on fire. Remain bold and do not get distracted. Here's what the enemy wants to do. Oh, yeah, 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 you had a great encounter with God. That was good, but what about this over here? Yeah, but you need to focus more on that. But you have too much going on. You can't do it, and little by little, he lulls you back to sleep, and he lulls the church back to sleep. The church has been asleep for far too long. The church at large, the church across the globe has been asleep for far too long. The American church has been asleep for far too long. It's time for us to wake up, to return to the house of God, the presence of God, and remain on fire for God. And not allow the enemy to sing a killing lullaby that puts us back to sleep where we get comfortable coming on Sunday, doing what we did, doing our church thing, and going home. Meanwhile, people are dying in their sins, and we have not done anything for it. 
We cannot be lulled back to sleep. Once we have recognized and returned to the presence of God, remain there. Remain in his presence. Every day you and I wake up, remain at the feet of Jesus. Every day we wake up, God, my life doesn't belong to you. I don't belong to you, Jesus. This is your life. I'm a vessel of clay. Put your treasure inside of me. I don't want anybody to see me living my life. I want you to live my life. I want them to see you inside of me. Remain in the presence of God every second of every day. We live our lives at his feet, surrendered fully to the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's not my decision. I don't take myself where I want to go. I go where he leads me to go. You don't take yourself where you want to go. You remain in the presence of God. And if the spirit leads, you follow. You follow him because we cannot be separated from the presence of God. That's what makes us a house of God. God's presence is what makes us the house of God. If the Holy Spirit's not welcome here, we can call ourselves a church, but it's not a house of God. You can call yourself a Christian, but unless the presence of God is at work inside of you, that is not a temple. It becomes a temple when God's presence is at work inside of you and I. Every second of every day. Here's the bad part. Bethel. Bethel was an important city in the Old Testament. In fact, it was mentioned the second most behind Jerusalem. Abraham had built an altar there. Jacob encountered God there. In fact, the, the, the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, even was there for a, a period of time. It's not mentioned a single time in the New Testament. The city of Bethel is not mentioned once. The issue was when the kingdom of Israel divided into two, King Jeroboam of the northern kingdom, he was afraid that people would leave Israel and go down to Jerusalem to worship. And so out of fear and out of pride, he set up an altar, a false altar. He set up a a statue of a bull and he set it up in Bethel, one in Dan and one in Bethel. So because of pride, because of disunity in the nation, because of all of the things that were taken, because fear of people leaving and going and all of those things, what once was known as a house of God, what once was known as a gate to heaven, now became known as a city of evil and idolatry. And if we are not intentional about walking in unity, if we are not intentional, uh, intentional about preserving the unity, if we are not intentional about remaining humble and doing the work of the Lord and uh, allowing God to do whatever, Lord, you are Lord of the harvest. We're just going to be your labors. You bring people, you take people, whatever it is, God, it's not for me to decide. I'm just going to be faithful where you have us. If we are too focused on the numbers, if we're too focused on pride and arrogance and disunity, then what quickly was known as a house of God can be left in ruins. If we're not intentional, if we are not intentional, if we don't recognize the power of God, return to the presence of God and remain in the presence of God, then a house of God, a church that once did great and mighty things can quickly become unknown. So what are we here to do? What are we here to do this morning? I, I pray that you've been fasting and praying. I hope that what we've been fasting and praying for, what are we believing God for today as we anoint the house? As the praise team gets ready to make their way back up, we're going to enter back into a time of praise and prayer and worship. As a church, as a church, we're asking God set us apart. God, consecrate us as a house of God. Let your presence fill this place. Let this be a dwelling place of your presence. The angels would ascend and descend upon Jesus Christ that is walking up and down these aisles. We're asking that he would saturate us in the oil of his Holy Spirit. Saturate us in the anointing. And we're going to build altars. And we're going to offer up sincere worship to God. We're going to offer up sincere worship to God. We're going to put away all idols. We're going to put away all hindrances. Our, as individuals, we will be obedient. As families, we will be obedient. In our marriages, we will be obedient. Our kids' ministry, we will be obedient. Youth ministry, obedient. Groups, whatever it is, as a church, we will walk in obedience and we'll lead the way for others to see. We stand on the promises of God. And we watch as he expands and increases our impact through this church in this community around the world. But you and I have to prepare. You and I have to have a heart and a mind that is prepared and ready to recognize, return, and remain in the presence of God. My prayer, my prayer this week, 
My ask this week is that every single one of us would be stirred up. My ask is that there would be an intensity return to the house of God, the the American house, the world house, your house, my house. That we would break out of all laziness, break out of all distractions, and that God would take that little spark that, yeah, maybe it once was a lot bigger, but God, take where, take where I'm at. God, I give you what I have to offer. And he would take it and he would fan it into flame. And that you and I would remain on fire throughout the week and that we would come together in an explosion of the presence of God because individually we've been in his presence all week. And we, we come together in the house of God and the fire joins together and the whole church is set on fire for God. That's my prayer. My prayer is that because the oil of God is continuous, because the anointed continual flow of God's oil, it will keep the flame lit. God will keep the flame alive if you give him something to work with. You give them a fire, you give them a spark, give them an ember, whatever it is. You give God something to work with and the oil of God will keep it blowing. The wind of God, the spirit of God will keep you on fire if you are dependent, if you stand in his midst. So as we are on fire, as this church is on fire, as we come together, the oil of God will flow and we will see the entire church anointed, set on fire for God's glory. As God's glory will fill this place, because there is a continual oil of God that flows and keeps the flame lit, that light, here's my prayer. Here's my prayer. That as we are set on fire for God, that this place, this church is a fire, that it is a light and the oil of God will do its part. But as we are willing This house will be a light that will force the darkness out. This house will be a light that will force oppression and possession to leave in the name of Jesus. That this place would be a light that all addiction must go in the name of Jesus. That this house would be a house of God set on fire for God. That all sickness, all depression, all anxiety, all fear, all of those things have to go because the darkness cannot inhabit the light and this is a house of light. This is a house on fire for God. And as God's glory fills this place, those things have no choice to leave. I believe that God's anointing will flow. I believe that God's anointing will heal. I believe that it'll create unity and restore marriages and restore families and bring prodigals home. I believe that we'll have strong biblical families. I believe that we'll have laborers raised up and sent into the field of harvest. I believe that God will do all of those things. I'm praying that we, as anointed priests and kings, will take our fire into the community. We'll take our light into the community so that not just anyone who ventures in here, but no, your light is going out there. So that even as you're walking down the street, the darkness has to flee at the light coming off of you. Even as you're walking in your community and down Walmart, maybe you're just driving down the road. The darkness has no choice but to flee because the light of God that is at work in you. And I'm believing that that will change our community. I'm believing that we can expose and push back against the darkness everywhere that we go, not just in here. My prayer is that this church would be so set on fire would be so set on fire that it would be a beacon of hope and a beacon of light. That people would see this church on fire from miles away and that they would know that this is a place to go for hope. This is a place to go for healing. Can I tell you, I'm praying that the glory of God be so strong and intense that just by driving next to the church, people are healed, people are set free, people are delivered. It ain't nothing we do, it's the power of God at work. That's what I'm believing God for. I'm believing that people come in darkness, they will leave in the light. I'm believing that people come sick, they will walk out healed. I'm believing that people come bound, they're gonna walk out free because this is a house of God. You are a house of God. This is a place of God's presence. We will return to the presence of God and we will remain in the presence of God.
1 Corinthians 14 tells it ministers for a tongue to be in the house of the Lord where God will speak to his people and encourage his people. Why don't you go ahead and stand all across this place. We're going to get ready to enter in. Here's the, here's the weight. Can I tell you Can I tell you a weight of ministering wherever you're at, whatever your role of ministry would be? Here's, here's the weight. Here's the heaviness. You can preach your guts out. You can sing your guts out. You can witness your guts out. You can do everything that you were meant to do. And someone still refused the presence of God. The Lord has said that not everyone will respond. Not everyone will return. But there's a remnant. There's a remnant of people who in prayer and devotion and fasting and dedication will find themselves at an altar. They'll find themselves at an altar where everything inside of them is empty that God may fill them abundantly. Hallelujah. And it's only for those people that leave room for the Spirit of God that He fills. Only for those people that make the decision to return to God's presence, to seek God's presence, to seek His face, to find themselves at His feet. Those who are humbled those who humble themselves will be exalted. They who exalt themselves will be humbled. My prayer is that this church will be so on fire. So on fire. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. As this place is on fire, anyone who is bound, anyone who is lost, anyone is hurting, they're going to know that this is a place of freedom. They're going to know that this is a place of healing. We have to do our part to let it be so. We have to do our part to humble ourselves, to remove ourselves, to lay ourselves down and allow God to set us on fire. Because I do believe, I do believe that this place will be a house of God. I do believe that God's presence will dwell in this place. I do believe that this will be a gate of heaven. That anyone who comes in, anyone that drives by, sickness will flee, darkness will flee, oppression, all of those things. This will be a place of revival. This will be a place where the oil of God flows. I believe God wants and will do all of those things. But first, it takes a day of preparation. But first, today, this day, for you and I, is a day to prepare our hearts. To make up your minds. That we as a church make up our minds. That as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for you and your house, you will serve the Lord. We will lead our families in obedience. We will lead our families to the altar. Wherever you call, Lord, we will go. We have made up our minds that we will recognize the glory of God that's available. We will return and offer up right, obedient sacrifices, and we will remain and rest in the presence of God. Before God's fire can fall, we must build an altar. Before God's fire can fall, there has to be preparation. An altar where sinfulness, an altar where idleness, 
an altar where laziness and selfishness and pride and distraction and worldliness and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, an altar where all of those things must die before God will hear from heaven and heal our land and send revival, there must be a people, a remnant of people that are willing to do the difficult, the difficult task of humbling themselves. That's not easy. The difficult task of humbling themselves, fasting, praying, and believing for a move of God because they're not satisfied with where they're at. They're not satisfied with what God has already done. A group of people, a remnant of people that are making room in their heart for God to do more. This place must be a place of sincere prayer and worship. Remembering first who God is. Remember who he is. Remember what he's done. Be reignited with passion and a fervent spirit. Wrestling with God, not letting go until he blesses you. Then the fire will fall. Then the fire will fall and consume the sacrifice. Then the continual oil of the Holy Spirit will flow. Then we will see miracles, signs, and wonders. Then we will see God use this remnant of people, no matter how large or small, at Foley Assembly to accomplish the work he has for us because there's priority. There's a group of people that are intentional. There's purpose and there's preparation. And because of that, because of a remnant of people, this house will be set apart and anointed and consecrated as a house of God. I'm going to ask Brother Todd and Andrew if you guys will go ahead and make your way up. We're going to get ready to worship and pray together. And during this entire time, the altars are open. You can go ahead and adjust the lights, Caleb. During the entire time, we're going to cultivate an attitude, a heart of worship, an atmosphere of worship, an atmosphere of prayer. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to find yourself in an altar. I want you to get uncomfortable. I want you to get in the presence of God. I want you to return to the presence of God. I want you to remain in the presence of God. I want us to spend our time, the next several, several minutes, just worshiping and praying and say, here I am, God, use me. Anoint this house. Set this house apart. God, we are here for you. Brother Todd's going to be praying for individual and church revival and a fresh fire. And Andrew's going to be playing, praying that that fire goes out into our communities. Once we get done, we're going to pray. They're going to pray. We're going to sing some more. Some more are going to pray, sing. Some more are going to pray and sing. It's a house of prayer and a house of worship. I hope you find yourself comfortable. I hope you find yourself in an altar. I hope the Spirit of God comes and fills this place. Let's pray and worship together. based off of Exodus chapter 19 focus, focusing on verses 10 and 11 it says the Lord also said to Moses go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow let them wash their garments and let them be ready for the third day for on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people oh don't we want God to come down in our sight today oh heavenly father we welcome you in this place of worship. Search our hearts for anything that displeases you. Forgive us for rejecting you and rejecting your sacrifice on the cross by acting out our rebellion. Reveal to us all the sin that separates us from you. Lord, we rid ourselves from today's idols. We repent and turn from our wicked ways. Lord, create 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 in us a new heart and reignite our first love with you. Oh Lord, set us on fire, a fire that will purify us and allow your glory to fall fresh on us so that you, God, would be glorified, exalted, and praised. Give us a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit, a fresh anointing, a passion to know you more deeply. Let us be obedient in our faith by serving you more by loving and winning the lost. Holy Spirit, have your way with us today and every day. I'm going to be focusing on Romans chapter 12. We're going to emphasize starting in verse 9. In verse 9, it says, Let love be without dissimulation, or let love not be disguised. 
let your love be shown immediately. It says, abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, and continuing in instant prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints and given into hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condense to the men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. We're praying today, Lord, for this community. We know that things are going to come against us as a church, but we just got to continue to show the love. Lord, your first commandment is to love you with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength. But the second is like the first, and that is to love your neighbor as we love ourselves, Lord. We need to focus on that today. We need to focus on being able to go out into our communities, whatever our jobs may be. We know that we are reaching every person in this community. We're going into touch. We're coming into communication with people each and every day. Let us show your love. Let us not show impatience. Let us not show, hosp uh, let us not show hostility, but instead show hospitality. Lord, we come before you today, God that you'll just continue to move in this church, continue to grow, continue to grow here to where we can grow in an outreach ministry to this community. Let us begin to go out and step forth, step forward as a church into this community, into this state, into this world, wherever it be that you may take us, God. We come before you and we pray. We come before you and we pray that you continue to move we come before you because we know that the times are coming to an end lord let us be the last step there's going to be a time there's going to be a time on this earth where every person is going to have to make a decision which gates they're going to walk through you're going to walk into the gates of heaven for eternity or you're going to walk into the gates of hell let this church be that church that stands at the gates of hell and says this is your last chance to turn around let us be that church that says i know things have went wrong in your life but guess what i know the savior that can forgive all those sins and that can turn your life around to where you can do exactly what you're meant to do what you're called through god to do and that is to continue to reach others Heavenly Father, we pray that we are that church. We pray that we do not let a single person walk through the gates of hell without hearing the word of God and the gospel of love and the sacrifice that he made for us. In Jesus' name, we pray. If you can, would you come to the altar? Would you be that sacrifice? Your body is now the living sacrifice. We don't have to come to the altar with cattle, with oxen, with doves. We no longer have to do that. But instead, we just have to take that walk. We just have to take that step. Let us come to the altar and let's, let us be that living sacrifice and prepare ourselves for whatever God has us to do in this world. Come on, let's pray and worship again. Let's worship. I want you to devote yourself individually. I want you to say, God, anoint me, fill me, set me apart, this church apart, set us apart. Let's, let's seek revival. Let's seek the presence of God together. Let's go ahead.
joy I found Surrendering my crown At the feet of the King Who surrendered everything And oh, the peace
God, you take all that we have. We lay everything down at your feet as Sister Valerie and Dwayne and Kayla go ahead and make their up, make their way up. We're gonna continue to pray. We're gonna continue to worship. I don't want you to leave. I hope you're not uncomfortable in this moment because if you are, if you're uncomfortable with worship, I got bad news. We're gonna be worshiping for a really, really, really long time. So I hope you just find yourself comfortable in the presence of God, seeking the presence of God. We're about to pray over our men, our women, our families, our marriages, our, our children, our babies, our nursery, our youth, all of it. We're going to about to pray. So if you have your family with you, if you have your spouse or whatever it is, I want you to pray over them. I want you to lead them to the altar. I want you to lead them in the place of obedience. I want you to cover them in the blood of Jesus, anoint them, set them apart. I want you to pray for our, our nursery ministry, our children's ministry, our youth ministry, every every child child, everyone, all of our men's ministry, women's ministry, we're just going to anoint everybody, every ministry in the house of God, we're going to anoint and set apart. So Sister Valerie, why don't you go ahead and pray? And after she gets done praying, the, the, Brother Dwayne's going to pray, Kayla's going to pray, and then we're going to worship some more. Lord, I lift up the women of this house to you, Father. Lord, many carry lots of burdens, God. Lord, whether it's motherhood, grandmothers, Father, whatever season they're in, Father. Some of them are dealing with illnesses, Lord, and they have many, many burdens. But God, I'm just asking you, Father, in the busyness of everyday life, Father, just the chores, Father, the burdens, Father, whatever it is, disobedient children. Father, we lift it all to you, Father, and we lay it at your feet. Lord, whatever chaos, whatever, whatever check marks that have to be in and out, day in, day out, day, Father. Lord, I just ask, God, that you would just create time for these women, Father, to be in your word, God. Lord, that they would find strength on your promises, Father, that they would stand on your promises, Father, when the distractions or whatever, the lies of the enemy try to creep in, Father. Lord, I pray, God, that you would bring back to the remembrance of all the promises that you've given them, Father. Lord, I pray that they would find strength in your word. Father, they'd find strength in the fellowship of other believers, God. Lord, I thank you that they're strengthening them this hour, God. And Lord, whatever they're waiting on, God, Lord, I, pray, I thank you that you're going to use that as a testimony, Father. As they're waiting on their healing, Father, they're waiting on wayward children to come home, whatever it is, God. Lord, I thank you that you're going to use it, Father, for your glory to reach this world for such a time as this, God. Lord, I lift up these families, Father. We know that there's many emotions that can go on with families, Father, whatever hurts, whatever offenses, God. Lord, we just apply the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus to whatever is going on, Lord. Father, I thank we speak destruction to the plans of the enemy over families. We know that he hates families. But, Father, we just loose your will. We, we loose the holy angels of heaven, Father, just to come and open up lines of communication where there would be no more hurt, no more offenses, Father. Lord, we pray that you would just bring reconciliation, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the prodigals that are coming home, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would just have your way, Father, with these women and these families, God. Whatever season of life, whatever their journey they're on, God. Lord, I thank you that you meet them where they are, Lord. That they sense your presence like never before. They would sense you, Jesus. That they would not be burdened, Father, that they can use these times, Father, to bring glory to your name to reach this world, Jesus.
Lord, I pray that the babies and the toddlers and the kids, Lord, that you would be so evident in their life at such a young age, Jesus, that they have no room to doubt who you are. Lord, I pray that they grow up knowing that they know who you are, Lord, that you are their father and that you love them and that you will guide them. Lord, I pray that even at such a little age, Jesus, that you would begin to give them visions and dreams, Lord, that they would know you at such a young age and know to call you Father, that they would rest in your arms, Lord, and that they would begin to build their relationship with you. Jesus, I just begin to pray over our teens in the church, Lord. Lord, in the season in their lives where things can be confusing and the world is just out to get them, God. Lord, I just begin to rebuke anything that the enemy has in place to come against our, ch our teens and our children in this church, Lord. I rebuke it in Jesus' name. Yeah. Lord, I bind up yeah. any, anything that could come against them. Lord, I rebuke depression in Jesus' name. I rebuke anxiety in Jesus' name. I rebuke oppression in Jesus' name. Lord, you have not called us to be that way. Lord, you have called us to have a sound mind. Lord, I bind it in Jesus' name. I bind it in Jesus' name. Lord, suicidal thoughts, they have to leave in Jesus' name. You have no control over their life. You have no control over their life. You have to flee in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray peace over them. Jesus, I pray, pray that you just begin to cover them with a blanket of peace, Jesus. Lord, that you would just hold them in the, in the area that they're in, God. Lord, because you have called them. Lord, as they go out into this world, Lord, I pray that they would be a light. That everywhere their feet go, you are with them, Jesus. That people would begin to wonder what's so different about them lord i pray that they would go out even beyond lord that if you call them to be a missionary if you call them to be an evangelist if you call them to be a teacher or a preacher if you just call them to be a good friend lord i pray that you would just let them be what they are called to be in their season of life lord i pray that all of our girls would be a proverbs 31 woman Lord, I just pray that they would be the mothers that they're called to be, that they would be the wives that they're called to be. Lord, any illnesses or disease, I rebuke it in Jesus' name that try to come upon them. Lord, I pray that you would just continue to just love on them. Lord, that our boys would become men of God. Lord, that they would lead their wives and their children to you, Lord. Lord, that they would stand firm on your word, God. And Jesus, I just give you all the praise and the honor and the glory, God, because I know that you are going to do all of these things, God. I believe that you will do all of these things, Jesus. And it's your precious and mighty name I pray. Amen. If everybody would just take a seat for just a moment in this holy reverence of God's spirit and presence uh, this is a surprise to Pastor Ryan um, when he asked me the other day if I would pray God gave me a message and I've been trying for two days to get out of it um, sometimes that happens sometimes you just you just say God why me but God has sent me to give you this message and I want your good ear. I don't want any distractions. I want you to listen with your good ear. Listen to what the Lord has said. I know not everybody will receive this message today, my message or the message as a whole, because in the New Testament, Jesus addressed people from the crowd, the multitude, his followers, but he gave his heart and his words and his intimacy to his disciples. So you may not be one of his disciples this morning. You may be one of the crowd or one of the multitude,
But this is your moment this morning in the presence of the Lord to become his disciple, to follow him. So with that, I want you to turn with me to Malachi chapter 1. Thank you, Jesus. Help us, Lord. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts? To you priests who despise my name. This is the Lord speaking. Let it speak to you this morning. Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar. Defiled food on my altar. In what way have we defiled you? The Lord says, by saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is that not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? Says the Lord of hosts. But now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us. While this is being done by your hands, will he accept you favorably? Says the Lord of hosts. Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it, in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled, and its fruit, its food is contemptible. You also say, oh, what a weariness, and you sneer and scoff at it, says the Lord of hosts, and you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. This you bring to offer. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver, who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. All of that is saying that the Lord will not receive our second best. He will not honor our leftovers. He will not honor when we come to Him in weariness. Oh gosh, I come to you today as a sacrifice. No, you come to Him because He is a great King and He is worthy of great praise. His name will be exalted. His name will be lifted up. We will come to Him with holy hands and righteousness in our heart and holy hearts purified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Who told you that you could go to that cross and then walk away carrying all that junk? Carrying all those sins? God didn't tell you that. The enemy lied to you and said it's okay to walk away with that and you can still lift up hands to the Lord. Jesus said to sacrifice, put to death the deeds of the flesh. He said, unless you forsake all, you cannot be my disciples. That is tough. That is hard. But God loves us and he wants us to worship and honor him through our lives. We've got to change who we are and who we've been. We are the church of the living God. Jesus Christ, risen Savior. We've got to lift up holy hands to him. 
pursuing and seeking righteousness, not giving him our leftovers, but giving him our best because he deserves our best. He is a holy God that desires a relationship with you intimately. He gave his son on a cross, shedding his blood so that he could have that relationship with you. Not so you could continue in the walk that you've been in, but so you could be a new creation. All things have been put to death. New things has came up. Receive the word of the Lord this morning. It is not a rebuke, but God reminded me when I was trying to get out of it that he corrects those that he loves and that he loves us dearly and deeply, but he will not let us keep on with this facade. If we want to worship God, we must worship him in spirit and in truth. I'd like to pray now for the men and then pray for our marriages, and then we will go back into a time of worship. Father, I just thank you for the men of this church, Lord. I just thank you for their hearts and their unity and their fellowship, Lord. Father, you said that it is not good that man be alone. And Father, I just thank you that you are raising up in this house, Lord, a group of men, Lord, who will stand together, lock arms, and battle together, Father. That we'll walk through life, Father, together, Lord as disciples of Jesus Christ, growing in the love and the knowledge of our Father, our Savior, our Lord. Father, I just thank you for them. Father, I just pray that you would raise up something inside of us again, Father, that we be warriors, Father, that every man would stand in his place, Father, that you have placed him, that every man would be a watchman on the wall where you have put him, Father, that we no longer run from that spirit of Jezebel, Father, that we no longer be afraid of those things and that we tolerate her, Father, but we be men of actions, men of warriors, Lord, that we stand up against that tide that has been coming against us, Lord, and that we say this far and no further, Lord, that we are men of God, Lord. We are called to be courageous and to be brave, Father, and that we would lead our house to you, Father, that we would represent you, Lord. Father, help us to have that spirit again, Lord, to be courageous, Lord, to be brave, Lord, to be solid and steadfast, Father not wavering to and from, Father, but to stand fast on the word of the Lord and who you have called us to be, Lord. And we just thank you for it, Father. Lord, I pray for the marriages this morning, Father, in this church. Father, I just pray a hedge of protection around each one of them, Father. Lord, I pray this morning for the, the wives, Lord, that as your word says that their desire would be for their husbands, Father. And Father, I pray that you're for the husbands, Father, that they would love their wives just as you, you love the church, Father. Father, that we would walk that out and live that out, Father. That she would be a helpmate for him, Father. That she would not be a distraction and a, and a determined, Father, but she would be a helpmate for him, Father. She would come along beside her husband and lift him up and strengthen him, encourage him, Father, as he follows you, Lord, as he seeks to bring his house into your house, Lord. Father, I just pray a special blessing over those marriages, Father. None of us have gotten it right, Father, all the time, so, Father. So we just ask for forgiveness over those times that we have messed up, Lord. And we begin anew right now today, Father. Brand new in our marriages, Father, we begin new. And we ask that you touch it, Father, and you bless it and you honor it, Father. That our marriages are not a contract, Father, because our contracts can be changed. But it is a covenant, Father. It is a covenant between us with you, Father, and it cannot be broken. It cannot be changed. We claim that blood covenant over our marriages, Father, that it be honored, Father. And we just thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for your presence in our families, Father. Just help us to raise up against the tide that's coming in this nation, Lord. That we stand fast together, Father, as couples. That we begin to be together, Father. Stand together. At least the two walk together. How can they, Unless they agree, how can they walk together, Father? Help us, Lord, to do that. Help us to be in agreement with one another. Not pulling and fighting against each other, Father, but following you with grace and mercy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to your name, Father. You be honored. You be glorified, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray.
Amen. Let's stand and worship together. Let's keep entering into the presence of God. You cover your family in prayer, your marriage in prayer. Lead them to the altar, whatever it is, but let's worship the Lord together. The 
over every family. God, we speak the name of Jesus over every stronghold, every chain. God, we speak the name of Jesus. God, we plead the blood of Jesus. God, we come and we worship you and we glorify you. We set ourselves apart, God. Here we are. Take our fire. Set us on fire for you, Jesus. Cover us in the blood of Jesus. God, reignite us again. Stir us up again. Stir, set us on fire again. Anoint us again. Let the glory of God fall again. You've done it before, God. Let revival come again, Lord. We believe you, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. As to Sasharian, Brother Rick and Sue, as you guys make your way up, we're going to get ready to pray over all ministries, all groups, all leaders, classes, whatever it is, everything that we do here, we're going to pray for revival in this nation, pray over revival in this world. We're just going to lift up the name of Jesus, and then we're going to worship some more. Let's pray, Sister Sherry. I'm over the Never Alone group, and um, this week, Gary and I went to the facility where our church ministers and does nursing home ministry. We do a devotion once a month. And this lady came in. I just want to tell you how good our God is. She was new to our Bible study, but she came in with her Bible. She came in with her prayer list from her church. And she sat down and she was grieved because they were having Bible school this week and it was the first time she wasn't there. She'd moved hundreds of miles, her family brought her here. She didn't have a friend here. She left her church behind, but she had her Bible and her prayer list and she wanted us to pray over her church's prayer list. We had our Bible study and we had a few minutes extra and Gary and I had been to the thrift store and we saw some Gaither videos we picked them up we thought the people would enjoy those and I asked the social life coordinator can we pop one of these in she said you know what our new resident loves the Gaithers and so we got that set up and Gary and I were getting ready to leave and this one man there was one empty seat and Tommy said sit down Sherry and I sat down next to this new lady and after a few minutes, I looked at her, and she had this smile on her face, and she said, I'm in heaven. She said, my husband and I used to travel around to listen to gospel music. That was our passion. That's what we love to do. And this is our favorite group. She's a widow. And I looked, looked at her, and I thought, how good is our God? And when I was leaving, I told the social life coordinator, I said, you know what? She's only been here. She said, she's only been here two, three days. A few days before Gary and I had been in the store, and those were on the shelf brand new for a quarter apiece. God had allowed us to pick those up and bring them in there. And I had a front row seat to see God bless that lady that day. Because you know why? She has been faithful to God all these years. And she might have been in that place without her family, without her friends. But she had God's presence. And she had God's favor. Because when you are faithful to God, He moves heaven and earth to be faithful to you. 
She still was somewhere where she didn't know anybody and she was still walking with a walker. But she had the presence of Jesus in there with her. And she said in her own words, I'm in heaven. So we're going to pray today for the widows, for those who are alone, for those who are downcast, for the elderly. Maybe you feel forgotten. But God sees you. He knows where you're at. And he can get you what you need. That's what that said to me. Father, we thank you that you are acquainted with our grief. You said you are acquainted with our sorrows. And Father, today we lift up the widows and the husbands list today. And we pray, God, that you would minister to them through this church. We pray, God, that you would meet their spiritual needs. We pray, God, that you would meet their emotional needs. We bind loneliness. We bind depression. We bind anxiety. I pray, God, that you would meet their financial needs. I know, Father, that they're coming home and they don't have a husband anymore to talk to, but they can talk to you. Father, fill their home with your presence. Fill their lives with believers who can comfort them, encourage them, and lift them up. And Father, let this church be a church that cares for the widows and the fatherless and the destitute and the lonely because you care. And we thank you, God, that you care. going to be praying for our nation from 2 Chronicles 7 14 if my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven will forgive their sins and will heal their land Lord I come to you today I'm thanking you that we know you hear us when we pray. We thank you that you answer when we pray. And I come today with a sad heart, and I say to you that we recognize the condition of our nation. We recognize that this nation, Lord, that was founded on a desire to worship and love you, a nation that created laws and commandments based on your word. Our laws are based on you, Father. But now we see a generation raising up, wanting and actually creating in new laws of abominations, evil workings, things that are opposed to what your word said. Lord, we are ashamed for our nation. And Lord, we come today and we say we also recognize the condition of the church. For Lord, we know, as Pastor said today, that if a light is shining, the light drives out the darkness. We have gross darkness in our nation. And this is saying to me that our church is in need of help. We are in need of doing what you've just told us to in, in Chronicles. So I say to you, Lord, that we are ashamed as a church. We know there's a remnant, God, and we thank you for that. But I'm praying for the church as a whole in our nation because as our church becomes a light, darkness will be driven back and our nation will return to you. So I pray today, Father, and I say, we say, we call on your name, Lord, today, and we repent of the sins of turning from our first love. We as a church, Lord, repent for allowing the cares of this world to draw us away from you. We repent and we choose today to turn from these wicked things. We choose to put you first in our lives and to honor you. So because we have done this, Father, we've been obedient to your word. We're now asking you, will you come and heal our land? 
Will you save our nation, Lord? I ask for you to release revival among the church. Would you release revival, more importantly, Lord, in the Congress, in the Senate, among our government agencies as they group together? And sometimes they start out with a prayer. I'm asking, Holy Spirit, would you release your anointing during that prayer time? Would you cause the blinded eyes to be open? We say as your people and given your authority, Jesus, we bind the enemy from blinding the eyes of those that are, that are not saved. When the word is preached, we ask in the name of Jesus for blinded eyes and ears to be open in this nation to hear your word because we know it is your will for all to be saved. So that means they've got to hear your word. So we commit to you today also, Father, that we as a church, we love you. We choose you as our God. We say to you today that we will not turn from the left or the right, that we will stay on the straight and the narrow. We also say, Father, that it is our desire and our plan to follow your will and to be a light. We say that we will stand in the gap for our nation, that we will fast and pray for our nation to return to you. We say that we will also serve as watchmen on the wall for Israel and for our nation also, Lord. So I ask today, Father, would you just come and release in our nation great revival. Let your word come in like a hammer, as you said in Jeremiah. Break into our nation, into our, all of our government areas with your word and let salvation come to our nation again. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you put that scripture up for me, I'd appreciate it. The, one of the things that we're blessed with is we have the opportunity to vote in a elect a government to rule over us. And you young folks, y'all really do need to pay attention to what this scripture says because when I was young, I never thought our government would be what it is today. I didn't have any concept of people that were led by evil would rule over our government, but I think we're there now. And we now have a government in Congress that people openly hate and pray against Israel in their way they rule and govern. And our nation has always been tied to the fate of Israel, good or bad. And so I would encourage our church, all of us, to please be in prayer for our Jewish brothers and sisters because the people that are teaching this new doctrine say Jesus wasn't a Jew. And, you know, they obviously don't read their Bible too much. But I wanted to call your attention to this one word, and that's reproach. And when you look this up in some of the religious dictionaries, repro reproach means shame. It means uh, another another version says it's dishonor and so we're now in a period of time in our nation where our government is dishonoring all the blessings that this nation was formed with and that that for us older people it really hurts us because those of us who have worked so long and the veterans that we have that sometimes they're not even honored anymore and so as as we enter this season of prayer and asking god to forgive us please ask for forgiveness for this this government and god doesn't want them in hell either and so they can be saved they can turn from their evil but i wanted you to see this scripture because righteousness is what's going to exalt our nation and I'm thankful to be a member of a church that still believes in righteousness I also have a feeling 
a sense that things are going to get much worse. And so the only thing that can stave off that is God's always going to have a remnant. And I know this church is part of that remnant. And I'm thankful to be part of that. So let's pray for our nation real quickly here. And uh, I just thank you, Lord God, that this nation was founded on your belief. This nation was founded in freedom of religion. And Father, we enter your gates this morning with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. And we praise you as the true God. Jesus, we praise you for what you've done, not only for us, but also for our country. Thank you, Jesus, that we've been able to send missionaries out, that we still can worship in freedom. And we know, Jesus, there are theirs in our government now who would take that right away in a heartbeat. But we know, Jesus, that you make intercession for this church. You make intercession for us each and every day. And we thank you for that, Jesus. And Holy Spirit, we pray that there will be a new change of heart, not only in our government, but in our churches. And we know, Holy Spirit, that you lead us into all truth and that you will show us things to come. And we ask you, Jesus, to prepare our hearts as Christians for not only the evil that's here in our government now, but the evil that's going to come. And as you prepare our hearts for this, Jesus, we ask you to lift all our brothers and sisters in Israel up in prayer each and every day. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem and we pray for the government that's over Israel also, as well as our government, Lord. Jesus, we love you this morning. We thank you for what you've done for us and our church. Lord God, we love you this morning. We thank you for all that you've done for our church and our government. And we ask you now to seal these prayers. Holy Spirit, seal these prayers that we lift up to heaven this morning. We ask your seal on those in Jesus' name. get ready to stand and worship together. You go ahead when you're ready. Heavenly Father, God, we welcome you in this place. Continue to receive our worship. Lord, turn our hearts toward you, our eyes toward you, our minds toward you. We have a longing in our spirit for you. God, a longing in our presence. God, we need you, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Sweep across every family, every leader, every teacher, every group, every ministry, every person, every, God, every person in this community, every person in this world. God, all across the world, God, we need, we all need you a fresh touch from you, a fresh outpouring of you. God, we worship you, Jesus. God, we worship you, Jesus. Let's worship you. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man. in his blood and what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough I trust in God my Savior the one who will never fail he will never fail I trust in God my Savior the one who will never fail 
submission All is at rest I'm the author of tomorrow Has ordered my steps So this is my story This is my Solomon was dedicating the temple in chapter 6 of 2 Chronicles. She read chapter 7 where God promised, if my people. That was an answer to Solomon's prayer. Because in the chapter before, Solomon said, he knows the man, hearts of man. And he said, when your people are defeated in battle because they have sinned. And then they come to you and they cry out to you, please, Lord, hear them. And when there is no rain on the land because your people have sinned, and they come back to you, Lord, please hear them, please. And God's response was, if my people who are called will humble and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will. I will hear them. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard. And he answered, that's why I trust him, that's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him, that's why I trust in God, my Savior.
trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I want to pray over the unity of the house right now. And before we go into this last and final song, Miss Loretta, we want to pray over you. Anyone else who needs special prayer, we're going to pray over you. Pray that God would heal you and anoint you and fill you. If anyone else needs prayer, you come up during this last song. But after I pray, we're going to go into it. Look, you've already been in church for almost three hours. Just worship God one last time.